and welcome to Food for Thought, World Bites new show where we feast on food and great ideas. I'm Raya Hedges and in our first episode we will be chewing over the Scottish referendum on independence. In this programme we will be asking, is the UK better together or would Scotland be better off going it alone? And to help us debate this today we have two special guests. They are, to my left, Dolan Cummings. Dolan is a veteran of the Institute of Ideas and writes on the role of public intellectuals and humanism in the 21st century, as well as being a leading member of the Manifesto Club, which campaigns against the hyper-regulation of everyday life. And on my right, we have Craig Fernington. Craig writes widely on issues including Scottish politics, science and gay rights, and works for the Institute of Ideas. So to kick things off, Dolan, would you be able to tell us what you think about the referendum? Well, it's an interesting period that it's happening because the, the, the question is Scotland should be an independent country. Um, and there's always been a minority in Scotland who wanted to be independent because they were nationalists. I think something slightly different is happening this time. Uh, the reason the referendum is happening is because the Scottish National Party, which is for independence, won at the last Scottish parliamentary election. But the Scottish Parliament, which is devolved from Westminster. But I think... There's wide agreement, actually, that most people voted for the SNP, not because they wanted independence, in fact, but because they were fed up with the other parties, the Labour Party and the Lib Dems in particular, um, who have been ruling in the Scottish Parliament and are not particularly popular. So I think there's a, a, a mood for change. But the fact is that um, a party for independence did, um, did win. So it's fair enough that we're having the referendum and basically testing it. Did you mean you want to be independent, separate from, from, from the UK, or was it just a kind of protest vote? I think it's really interesting to see some of the arguments on both sides. I think the no campaign has been quite weak. Um, so many people feel that the, the dynamism is behind the yes campaign and people will vote for independence. Um, personally, I, I hope that doesn't happen and I, I'd argue that it's a, a mistake. To me, it's, it's a kind of illus illusion that if Scotland was independent, things would be better. You know, most people in Britain aren't happy with the Tory uh, coalition government. What, 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 else, what alternatives are there? Um, I think Scotland has that kind of, at least in theory, well, if we were separate, it would, be all, it would all be different. But that's what I really want to challenge, because I don't think it's true. Does that mean people are disenchanted with the mainstream political parties and their inability to provide a meaningful vision of society to captivate people and their votes? Yeah, to an extent. I think the thing to remember is that actually in Scotland, the SNP are a mainstream party. And it's not a kind of crank thing to vote for them. It, it's not really fair to compare them to, say, something like UKIP. I think what the SNP did do in the, uh, the Scottish Parliament, really, is um, they're effective managers. They've managed the policy decisions within the Scottish Parliament very well compared to the rest of the parties there. Are Scotland ready to get to be independent or not? I would argue that we have to have a referendum because that's what you know, the party that was voted for does stand for that. So whether we think we're ready or not, then democratically, I think it has to, has to be done. Mm. But um, as to whether Scotland's ready or not, I think some of the weakest arguments that have been made against independence say it'll be a disaster, we won't cope, um, uh, Scotland's too small, there'll be all kinds of problems. Um, and a lot of people reacted against that. And they said, well, you're saying we're, we're not good enough to look after ourselves. That kind of rubs people up the wrong way, I think. Um, so I think it's... It, that's one of the reasons that the, that the No campaign has done so badly and the Yes campaign has picked up a bit of um, dynamism on that. But I do think it's possible to say, yeah, let's have the referendum. Most Scots don't want independence. Um, and let's you know, talk about the substantive issues rather than kind of scaremongering about what might happen. Um, to, to me, it's, it's a case of just saying, is this the solution? I don't think so. Even though maybe <clears throat> the majority of Scots may not want to be independent, is there an increase in nationalism with, within Scotland? I think not. I mean, I'd be interested in what Craig says. There's always been a small minority, or a yeah, substantial minority, but very much a minority, maybe from 10% to 30%, who just wanted Scotland to be independent because they were nationalists. They felt, I'm Scottish, not British. I like Scottish history. I believe in Scottish values, whatever those might be. There's always been a minority that wanted that. And then there's always been another minority who felt strongly British and were very much against independence. And then in the middle, there's been the kind of big um, the majority who are more ambivalent or pragmatic about it. I think in the past, most of the 20th century, um, the thing is that both the left and right, both, both sides of, of mainstream politics were against independence. So the right, the Conservative Party, obviously stand for the union. Small C Conservative, they don't like big change, so they just wanted to keep things as they were. But also in the Labour Party, 
um, there was a strong sense that it was important to keep the labour movement united, because the labour movement stood for the trade unions and so on. And they said, no, we should stick together as a kind of united working class. There was also recognition that nationalism is maybe a right-wing ideology. People used to say the SNP were the Tartan Tories, that they were just, um, you know, they would be for the, the boss class in Scotland. And the big thing that's happened over the past generation is that that left-wing argument against independence has pretty much collapsed. Because we don't really have a labour movement in the same way that we did in the 70s and 80s. Um, and I think most people feel that that whole tradition is kind of bankrupt. And so they're looking around for something different. People don't really see any kind of other options. And lots of people are very unhappy about the way politics in the UK is happening right now. And of course, that's not unique to Scotland. But in Scotland, we have a kind of ready-made answer for a lot of people, you know, which is get out of the UK and then we can kind of start anew. And obviously some of that ties into kind of fantasies, really, of Scotland being a kind of vastly more left-wing country than England. And which, is, again, ties into what Dolan's talking about, the kind of lack of a labour movement. People, I think, tend to grab onto this idea that Scotland and Scottish people in general, throughout all classes, are more left-wing. Um, and if it wasn't for the English, we'd have a much more um, fairer kind of socialist kind of country. I don't. I don't believe that's true. That kind of thing is, is a sign that you know some people see Scottish independence as the only way to kind of revive uh, their hopes of promoting kind of left left ideas. Does that tie in then with identity politics? Is that kind of being played? Because I've kind of read a few things about how there is this feeling that Scottish people are kind of innately more inclined to be socially democratic. But although Alex Salmond has obviously done some really great things with the elderly, with the student fees, but now it's kind of coming out how he hasn't done very much for women. He had the ability to actually raise the income tax, hasn't done that. Do you think there's kind of another argument from George Galloway that maybe actually it would be a race to the bottom if they did leave and we would kind of, they'd actually have no other choice but to, to be less kind of socially democratic? Is, it, is there any kind of truth in that argument or...? I'm very suspicious of the whole concept of social democracy. People talk about we'd be more social democratic. And what they usually mean is we'd be sort of like Norway or Sweden, you know, kind of vague Scandinavian sense. But the term social democracy, it's very ill defined. A hundred years ago, um, Russian revolutionaries called themselves social democrats. Um, in the 80s, social democrats were the right wing of the Labour Party, who split off because they thought Labour was too, um, too left wing. And now it's, it's kind of used in this vague way. It doesn't really relate to particular policies. Now, it's true, there are a couple of things that the Scottish government does differently. Tuition fees is probably the biggest, um, that tuition fees are paid, and that makes a difference to Scottish students. Um, but I think that's a lot to, to hook independence on. And the idea that there's um, a big cultural difference behind that, I think, is very suspect. You know, there's lots of people in England who would like to see free tuition fees. There's some in Scotland who probably resent it. Um, and it's really, it really ought to be a political argument rather than saying, here's what Scots think, here's what the English think. I mean, it's quite important to the Scottish people to feel like they are independent because they have nothing to do with the rest of Britain. That's, I mean, I would imagine that's how they feel. So they had a re recent um, conference for the SNP and it's been barely covered in the British newspapers. So feeling so rejected from the rest of the country, maybe that's why they're clamouring onto ideas about um, how independent and left they are and um, nationalistic they might feel. Yeah, I think for some people that are always resenting um, Scotland not having a high, high enough profile, but actually I think Scotland's got a, got, got a pretty high profile in, in terms of um, uh, the BBC, for example, as a national broadcaster, in terms of our politics. There's the famous West Lothian question, the fact that Scottish MPs get to vote over things that only affect people in England, um, whereas English MPs don't have the equivalent um, uh, in, in uh, Scotland. And you know, there's a long tradition of Scottish MPs um, at, at Westminster um, the, the Labour Party really wouldn't survive without, without the, the, the Scottish influence. So I think, yeah, people do feel slighted by it, but I think if you have a, the broader perspective is, I think Scotland doesn't really have a bad deal at all. And again, that's, that kind of thing about feeling um, marginalised by mainstream media is not unique to Scotland. The North, you know, or you know, the Cornish or the Welsh, um, or basically anybody outside London complain of this kind of, you know, being marginalised in this fashion. But there's not necessarily a uniquely Scottish aspect to that. It's interesting because um, in a recent lecture, Alex Salmond spoke about um, that the ordinary people in Scotland feel excluded from the decision-making process and that the, the referendum, in a way, would give the tools to address this exclusion. Mm. But 
thinking that people will be engaged, right, through uh, box ticking is, is bizarre, right? Because, I mean, it's kind of linked to the fact that, you know, there has been a degradation of politics and a lot of the parties have abandoned their working class electorate. So, what do you think about that? I think there is an aspect to which the referendum has kind of spurred up a bit of enthusiasm for politics in general. I think people, especially on the yes side, feel that you know there's there's opportunities out there to make big changes, and not just big changes in terms of being a separate country, but you know ha having a kind of new kind of political uh, setup. Well, Alex Salmon is not actually offering that because he wants to be part of the EU, which is extremely anti-democratic. And he wants the Queen to be the head of state, um, you know, so and, and be a kind of constitutional monarchy. Um, and it's just it doesn't make sense, really, that you know that his argument that Scotland can make it on their own is he's not offering that because he's saying no, we need to be part of you. There's definitely an element of kind of funny independence around it because I think Salmond and the SNP recognise that there is a minority who are nationalists who support them for that reason. And so they needed to appeal to other people and make, make them feel not too afraid. So they're saying, we're not going to change things that much. You know, we'll keep the Queen, we'll keep the EU, we want to keep the pound. Um, but there does come a question, well, how independent is that really? I mean, it's, it basically, uh, everything will continue to be the same, but the, the, the Hollywood Parliament has more powers. But again, defers to, um, to Brussels in the same way that, that Westminster does. Do you think there's been too much of a focus on that in the media? It seems like much more has been put on how uh, Scotland would cope without the pound or if they would be part of a sterling area. Is that, do you think, an actual weakness of the independence campaign in terms of really people of their fears, or do you think it's more of a spin on it put by us down south? I think there's definitely an element of, of over-technical discussion about, about the pound. Would it, would it work? Would it not work? I mean, someone, um, I read someone saying who was a, obviously just felt that for nationalist reasons Scotland should be independent and said, I don't care if we go back, go back to the growth, you know, going back from before the pound itself, um, the important is to be independent. And, you know, I don't agree with that, but I think it's a, it's a position I could respect. I do think it is an important debate, though, because it basically highlighted the fact that the, the SFP hadn't really thought about this. What are, what, are you, what are you presenting? What are you going to do? And they kind of say, oh, we're going to keep the pound. And effectively, that would mean... I mean, no one's saying Scotland couldn't use the pound, but the point is, should they have any say over policy? Um, so I think it's Panama uses the American dollar. Um, but when the American government changes policy to affect its, its currency, it doesn't say, oh, what about Panama? We must think about how this will affect the Panamanians. The currency union, which has been proposed by the, the SNP, would mean basically the, the British government and the Bank of England would have to take that into consideration. And I think there's a democracy question there because the Bank of England, through the government, is accountable to the voters and what's left of the UK. And I think it would be uh, unfair on them to say, well, actually, we're going to um, end up negotiating with, with Scotland and see how this uh, figures Scotland, which would be a, a separate country. So I think the fact that that hadn't been considered, I think a lot of people feel, yeah, there's something exciting about this idea of, um, a, a, of a new, new start with independence. But there's so little that's been thought through in terms, you know, the, the oil money. It's just assumed we get the oil money. It's just assumed that Scotland could keep its place in the EU, and really the consequences haven't been been um, thought through to any great degree. And I think a lot of voters will, for that reason, um, even if they are tempted by independence, will think actually this is pig in a pork, as the expression goes. I just like to say, as a Tamil um, coming from a people who have struggled for very long for independence within a country. Um, and as someone who lived and worked in Iraqi Kurdistan, again, a people who struggled for a long time for their own um, piece of land to call their own and their own government. I do believe that if there's any group of people living within an area and they want independence for themselves, they're perfectly entitled to it. And I do think Scotland has shown that they are capable of independence. They've been running their own NHS, um, running their own schools and universities, their own benefit systems, a police school and justice system. I do think that they have shown that they are capable, but also, more importantly, they are entitled to fight for their own freedom. Being independent, while it's a good idea in uh, theory, it doesn't always pan out in practice. I think, for one thing, it could possibly greatly weaken Scotland's position in the world. I think if you look in other countries around the world, which uh, might be part of some unions, but are uh, large independent, uh, like Jamaica, an independent country that's forced by the bigger countries around it, like the USA, to change trade or have restrictions on what they can, can and can't do. And especially with 
well, the S and P has done Scotland with uh, free tuition fees. They could easily run on a whole Britain platform and bring what they are arguing would make a better Scotland, such as free up the point of use childcare and inflation linked to minimum wage. They could apply that to the whole country and create a better UK rather than just a better Scotland. I think the SNP aren't actually offering an independence in the sense of empowering Scottish people, I don't think. What's the difference between, you know, kind of being a very small country within the EU and having kind of a lot of your, your laws being dictated by Brussels than actually which is further away than London? I suppose it's kind of a quick fix kind of a thing, or if we separate we'll be fine, but actually, will they be fine? There's no guarantees. Secondly, there's definitely got to be more to us being a nation together. There's, you know, we have to have something, you know, a belief in humans that we don't just kind of... I don't know, walk away from our problems like that. I'm Portuguese and over the years I have seen the effects that a small country like Portugal has um, suffered from being a small country in the EU, um, a rectangle in a corner which is engulfed by the Spanish economy and, and has to compete with the German, German and, and French um, economy as well. You know, a lot of the laws are dictated by the EU and Brussels um, and imposed on the people without having no say whatsoever. Uh, so, so I'm against independence and also because I think Scotland and England can come together and discuss, you know, once again, what they want to um, the future to be like. I think there's a slight confusion with the word independence because it sounds like a positive thing. Nobody wants to say, I don't want to be independent. And historically, the term independence was used when the former British colonies gained their freedom. And so that was about countries that were oppressed by an empire asserting themselves independently. Scotland's always been an integral part of the UK. You know, Scottish voters vote for MPs. They have the same representation as anyone else. So that's, um, to me, a very different situation. And that's why there hasn't been a strong nationalist movement in the past. It's always been a minority thing. If you compare something like the Tamils, the Tamils in, in Sri Lanka always fought for independence because they were oppressed by the Sri Lankan regime. In contrast, the Tamils in India tend to be proud Tamils and proud Indians because they buy into the idea of a country that respects them and, and they, have, they have a state, but they consider themselves part of the greater whole. And that seems to me what's the problem in Britain is that we don't buy into the idea of Britain as, as a whole. That's, but that's not just unique to Scotland. That's, that's, we were talking earlier about people, um, people all over Britain struggle to, to identify with Britain as, as, a, as a positive thing. So I think it's a bit illusory to imagine that Scotland has something distinct. If you look at you know, what would happen after independence, there isn't a new movement with, 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 with radic radical new ideas. It's the same parties that have been governing. So the day after independence, you'd have the Scottish Labour, the SNP, Scottish Liberal Democrats, and the small Conservatives with the same kind of policies. And if you look at what has distinguished the Scottish Parliament, it's not just tuition fees, which, by the way, the SNP didn't invent the idea of um, free tuition fees. That had been the status quo throughout the UK uh, beforehand. So it was just a case of um, reverting to that. Um, but what they, what they have done differently is, uh, you know, the, the, S, the, the Scottish Parliament, not having real power, has kind of used all kind, has kind of spent all its time um, managing people's behaviour. So it was the first, you know, they brought in the, the ban on smoking before England did. They brought in a ban on smacking. Um, they've got a huge campaign against alcohol. They want to have minimum pricing for alcohol. They want to stop young people drinking. Um, they've, they've tried to stop people shouting offensive um, chants and songs at football matches. It all really seems to be not about the people rising up and claiming something, as basically a government saying we want to reshape the people into our image. We think people need to be knocked into, into shape to behave in, in, in a civilised manner. It seems to me the, the opposite of, a, of an independence movement in that historic sense. It's much more about a political class trying to carve a niche for itself um, without actually um, mass support. And they, they kind of treat the people as if they're a colonial regime. They're saying, how can we make the people happier? How can we, you know, this isn't how a dem democratic government functions. It's how uh, a kind of overlord um, operates in a country where people don't have representation. But as David said, if you've got good ideas, why do you have to limit yourself to arguing them in, in Scotland? If they really think that's a platform and they keep talking about this wonderful opportunity, well, we have an opportunity in Britain to reshape things. Every morning is an opportunity to change things. There's nothing special about Scotland being independent. The problem is that although I think genuinely the Scottish nationalists and those arguing for independence, they're not subjectively anti-English. They they're not racist or, or anything like that. But they do tend to blame the English, or at least some English, for consistently returning um, Tory politicians. So there's an idea that they are the problem. And if we can unshackle ourselves from them, then everything will be all right.
Of course, there's no reason that, that would have to happen just for Scotland. If you, say, if you could take anti-Tory, then you'd take much of the north of England and Wales and chunks of the south as well with you. Um, the point is that the left, from the Labour Party um, and, and beyond, has failed to present a convincing platform that got people, that they got governments elected. You know, the Labour Party that the Scottish people were voting for in the 80s was a disaster, and you know the idea that you can revert to those politics, I think, is a, is a real mistake. Also, interesting to note, all this talk about social democracy and so on, most of the economic changes of Thatcherism have been completely absorbed into British politics now, and that, that's the SNP as well. So an SNP government in an independent Scotland would in some respects be no more left-wing than the Thatcher government in Westminster in the 80s because it's just it's, it's accepted the kind of changes that have happened. So that, to me, the idea that it's, that, that it's a kind of radical left-wing thing is kind of absurd. And I guess this is where a lot of support, I guess, for, for uh, independence comes from as well is the sense that the British state and the, the UK is dead. There's nothing you can do with it anymore. It's static. It shall remain this way forever. You can't change it. That's why we need to be independent, because we need to break out. And that's the only way new things can happen. Now, that, funny enough, is actually very negative. But it's pitched in a very kind of positive way, that you know, this is us getting out, getting out and, and, and doing things. And actually what you're saying is, uh, these kind of you know, 50 million people over here, uh, and this, this uh, state we've got here, is, is static and unchangeable, and there's nothing we can do about it. So do you think that kind of Russell Brand's kind of revolution, we need a drastic, drastic shake-up of our political institutions because it's obviously got to such a dire state that if people are actually actually considering independence, even though I'm sure most Scottish people realise that it is pitched as a, you know, we're going to change, but we're not going to change too much, which is exactly what Salmon's saying. So it's obviously a reflection on democracy as a whole within Britain and... It's quite sad, really. The UK, for all its, the feelings of our politics in terms of content, it's a functioning democracy. It's not, it's not something which is a, as anti-democratic as the, the, the EU. So the, the idea, yeah, maybe it's not, getting out of the EU wouldn't be the solution, but it might be the beginning of the solution. It seems to me getting out of the UK doesn't have any positive element to it at all. Um, but I do think that um, the idea of greater democracy rather than less um, is, is important. And that means people discussing substantive issues, especially to do with the economy. Because the kind of undiscussed um, background here is the economic situation. You know, part of the reason everyone's dissatisfied is because the UK economy is, is in a lot of problems. Um, and the SNP solution basically is something to do with oil. They kind of mumble about if we have the oil revenues, it'll be fine. And we, we've got some mathematician over here who's done all these sums and said it's going to be great. But what they don't really address is the bigger problem. Um, of, um, uh, of unemployment, of underemployment, of the fact that most of the, the, the many jobs people have are part-time and so on, and there basically is a lack of dynamism in the economy. And I don't think shuffling around who, who gets to oil revenues is going to make the difference there. One of the big problems in, uh, in the Scot Scottish economy is over-dependence on the public sector. And that's almost become an article of faith for many people who talk about social democracy. They think the public sector is good, the private sector is bad. And that's the kind of prejudice behind all this, which actually doesn't substantiate itself in any kind of real politics. So I think what we need to do is having, having more serious arguments about maybe Britain would be better off out of the EU, maybe Scotland would be better off out of the EU. You know, if, if the SNP had the courage to say, let's really go out alone and be out of the, uh, of the EU as well as the UK, maybe I'd take them a bit more seriously. But it seems to me they're not really trying to engage people in, in the, the issues that matter about how we improve our standard of living. That's, standard of living is you know, the, the essence of politics democratic politics. And when that's marginalised by discussions about smoking or, or football chants or all these other things that the, the, the Scottish government talks about, I think that indicates that we're not living in a healthy democracy. I mean, £500 here or there over the course of a year, that's really treating people like consumers, saying, you know, this way, you know, we're selling you a different bank account that gives you these benefits over, over, over those benefits. It's not really about saying, how do we have a, a much more dynamic society where there'll be jobs, um, new industries emerging, where you know, the next generation can expect to be substantially better off than the one before. Um, these, you know, these are controversial issues. Uh, it seems to me that that's, that's what's missing from British politics. And you know, if it was the case that the SNP said, look, let's get away, we've got whole new industries developing here, we're going to transform the country, we're going to uh, um, have a completely different, more technological economy. Um, the problem is the English, and this is why. If they could sh show that, then I would think a lot more Scottish people would say, great, let's get on board. But they're not doing that. They're just saying, let's get away. And what, what, I think what we need is a discussion. You know, whether maybe, maybe the solution would be um, for Scotland to be independent. Maybe you could break, break Britain up and it would be great. But nobody's demonstrated why that's the case. 
So it's just become kind of a kind of desperate thinking that you kind of close your eyes, imagine the Scotland you want, and if you vote yes, it'll come about. Well, how is that going to happen? Nobody's, nobody's explained that. Nobody's arguing about it, really. It's all about your instinct. And I think if they really did have answers, we're talking about it on a UK level. You know, why would the UK government have allowed this, this wonderful thing to be happening in Scotland and not be trying to, to learn from it? Nobody's trying to do that because there's nothing there. Recently, there has been a, uh, a change in the law in Scotland because Alex Salmon decided to give votes to 16-year-olds. How do you see that? I think you can have a reasonable discussion about whether or not 16-year-olds should uh, have the vote or not. I mean, for me, it just doesn't add up to how we view 16-year-olds in, in order today. I mean, we try to keep them in school longer, uh, we're really terrified about them uh, having sex or doing, uh, having uh, drinking. You know, In Scotland, there's an idea of giving them a name, social worker, right up until you're 18. We really don't view um, the 16-year-olds as adults, and for me, the idea that you have a say in society in which way it's going is an adult proposition. You know, that's what it's a sign that you uh, are individually an adult uh, capable of helping make the decisions for the whole society. So for me, it, within the, uh, this this circumstance, although I could be convinced in other other ones, votes for sixteen is is wrong. It's silly. I I, I don't think it adds up. Very interesting that, despite all this talk about independence, the. Scotland is still quite keen to keep monarchy, which just has perhaps been thought more as a symbol of uh, English and British rule. I think the monarchy is an interesting question. To me, it just shows that the, the SNP has been very conservative in the way they, they approach, because I think a lot of people feel unsettled by it. It's not because the monarchy is hugely popular in, in, in Scotland. They want to ease the transition as much as possible. So I think really the, the, the question is, Scottish people face all kinds of problems um, and could do with political solutions to them. But are the solutions needed by Scottish people different from those needed by English people? Or even from other Europeans? I mean, whether we have an independent Scotland, UK, a United States of Europe, that would be fine if it was democratic and accountable, unlike the, the EU. The important thing is the substance of politics. And that has to mean coming from the people. And to me, the, the campaign for independence is not coming from the Scottish people rising up against an oppressor. It's coming from the political class grasping at straws. Um, and I think people are being asked to, 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 to settle for something which is really uh, a delusion rather than a serious solution. I'm afraid that's all we've got time for, but I'd like to say a special thanks to our guests, Dolan and Craig. If you'd like to get involved in Food for Thought, then please email us. Yeah, no,